Payback is in the books. The show over delivered, but I do have some questions. Some really big questions. This show changed the bloodline story. It also shook up the Judgment Day story and uh ought to be interesting going forward how they, you know, jigger things around. Okay. Let's start with uh Seth Rollins comments, however. Before we get into the show, Seth Rollins was on After the Bell, which is, I guess, Corey Graves' podcast. I guess it still works. It's still on. A lot of WWE podcasts have gone by the wayside. Somehow, Corey Graves is still existing. Where Seth Rollins claims that we are in a wrestling boom. He says, thusly, we are in the boom, man. You've got to understand there's another company that just put 80,000 people in a stadium for one night. A week before that, we sold 90,000 tickets to WrestleMania, broke the all-time gate on the first day. There are seven, eight different television programs of professional wrestling on a week, not counting premium live events or pay-per-views. The talent roster across the board is beyond what any generation has ever put forward. I'm not taking anything away from the guys who paved the way. I stand on the shoulders of these guys. The business is bigger than it's ever been. It makes more money than it's ever made. It's healthier. The future of the business is so bright, and I'm so happy to be a part of it in any capacity. All right. So, uh, I didn't really want to talk about this before because I was thinking of, I wanted to put some thought into it first. And to be quite honest, I forgot about it. <laughs> I wanted to put some thought into it, and then I didn't give it a second thought, and I forgot about it. That's how important this stuff was. But I saw this floating around. And I want to say that I don't know how people want to define wrestling boom. I don't know how you want to define that. Um, Let's be honest, however. WWE is doing extremely well. Extremely well. They're filling out their buildings. They're selling a ton of merchandise. You know, things are going well. As far as I know, the video game is doing good. Things are going well. On the other side, AEW, and uh, I'm not saying this just because, you know, they did what they did on Saturday afternoon. What I'm saying is they did that 80,000 seat arena and then they came back to their home market, which is Chicago, and they got less than 4,000 seats sold. And that was Dynamite, which is their A show, by the way. And they sold less than 4,000 seats. You know, um, I wouldn't call that a wrestling boom. Uh, I saw the concession stands for Collision after people were very upset at something that Tony Khan said. We'll talk about during the Collision review. Nobody was buying merchandise. I don't think that there is a wrestling boom. I think that there are certain companies that are doing very well. Now, in terms of, well, there's eight nights a week or seven nights a week of wrestling. I mean, wrestling literally comes on every day. Literally every day. Monday, Raw. Tuesday, NXT. Wednesday, Dynamite. Thursday, Impact. Friday, SmackDown. Saturday is usually a GCW night. And Sunday, you know, toss-up. It could be anything. It's... But, you know, GCW doesn't have a television show. But everybody else has a television show. So you can pretty much watch wrestling any day of the week. That part is true. A lot of people are investing into the wrestling product. I talked about this um, a little bit. Maybe not a lot, but maybe not as much as I should have. When it was announced that Netflix was going to have this documentary on OVW. Which is, it looks to be similar to the Apple TV uh, documentary on the Monster Factory. It looks to be very similar, except for it's going to be on OVW. And I said that it looks good that rest, that um, and networks are interested in putting money into wrestling companies. 
And to have these wrestling companies, even at their training facilities like the Monster Factory and OVW, having docu-series on major platforms like Apple TV and Netflix, for, you know, companies like WB to be investing tons of money into AEW, for Anthem to own and continue to operate a wrestling company and Impact, for Fox to give WWE a billion dollars, for NBC given whatever amount of money they're given, for Raw and NXT, there's money there that was not available before. Same time, cable is dying, and it's 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 true that really the only thing that's keeping cable alive is mainstream sports, you know. Uh, college football, the NFL, basketball, stuff like this, and the pharmaceutical industry because they do all the advertising. So, <laughs> you know, because they advertise on cable news and all this kind of stuff, right? So, when you ask me if, it, if there's a wrestling boom, I say you got WWE doing very well. You got a lot of investment from uh other companies you got investment from netflix and apple even though apple tv canceled uh monster factory um you have investment from the wb you got investment from nbc you got investment from fox is that going to be continued investment this is the year to figure that part out you know tv ratings are dying on the vine they're up and down up and down with the the standard of what's good keeps changing because there's fewer and fewer people watching uh, cable television. So I wouldn't know. I wouldn't look at one metric, however, and say, well, this one metric is up. Therefore, wrestling boom. I would say there is a lot of metrics that are up. Therefore, the, the, comp- the businesses are healthy. You know, AEW sold a ton of merchandise during All In. I don't know what their merchandise is usually like, so I can't, you know, compare it. Um, But I can tell you this, uh, their attendance was, it's it's a one-off. You know, maybe they'll continue to run in the UK and they'll continue to get 80,000, 90,000 people coming to the show. But as far as I know, right now it's an outlier. WrestleMania is an outlier. WrestleManias will always sell, you know. We should be looking at the Raws, the SmackDowns. You know, if NXT can travel, we should be looking at that. And that should be telling us whether the boom exists or not. Um, And not, you know, these metrics that he decided to look at, which are pretty much only two. Because, yes, there's wrestling on TV every week. But what is, are, are people actually watching it? Like the companies are investing in it because wrestling fans tend to watch more than one product. And uh, you're trying to win some of that overlap when it comes to the various products. But Impact does like barely 100,000 viewers. I think they, do, they did 134,000 recently. And that was basically like a revelation. You know, I'm, I, it's got to be a money pit for Anthem right now. Sure, it's the number one show on that network, but that network is pretty much dead. You have to look at Impact like it's something that doesn't even generate a profit. It can't. I don't believe it does. So I wouldn't go wrestling boom. I wouldn't say that. So uh, that's really the only news and notes that I really wanted to to touch on. Let's get into this show. Uh, If I have to criticize the show, and I do think I have to criticize it. It was too long. Uh, the show was three hours. Uh, I know you may say, what are you talking about? Three hours is long. Is is not too bad. That's actually pretty average. Um, they probably could have did this in two hours and 30 minutes. <laughs> they probably could have did this in two hours and 30 minutes. I'm not saying speed run through everything. But what I'm saying is there are certain things that uh, went a little long. The first match went long, but man, it was good. Trish Stratus, Becky Lynch, Steel Cage match, really good match. Really good match. It seems that the promos and stuff was off. They couldn't manage to get that to work. But when they were just the two of them in the ring, they could make it work. Their match at 
uh, Saudi was very good. This one was even better. You know, the the risk that they took with the bulldog from the top rope, the manhandle slam from the top of the cage, the superplex spot was, was crazy. You know? And for this being Trisha's first cage match ever, like she's never worked a cage match before this, I think she did a damn good job. I think Becky Lynch did a really good job. This match cooked. You know? It really did. It really cooked. And there was no obvious and pathetic botching. Trish looked good here. You know, I know she doesn't always look that great, but she looked good here. You know, I just, it's a phenomenal match. So at one point, uh, Zoe Stark finds her way into the ring. Uh, Becky, because she's tough, she locks Zoe in with the rest of them, I mean, with the other two. And she basically fights Zoe off too. And then uh, she manhandle slam Zoe, manhandle slam uh, Trish Stratus off the top rope, gets the pin, gets the win, and gets the hell out of there. You know, nice, perfectly fine. It ended on the highest note of the match, which was Becky Lynch trying to get the manhandle slam, but she couldn't get it. And then she finally got it. It was off the top rope. Excellent finish. Uh, after the match, Zoe Stark tries to apologize for Trish Stratus for dropping the ball and not being able to help her win. Trish tried to get her away from her, but Zoe Stark was being very pathetic. So Trish smacked her and then told her to get out. Uh, then Zoe Stark walked towards the cage and then closed it, closing herself in there with Trish. Then she got in Trish's face and then she used her finish on Trish and ripped her Thank you, Trish shirt, and threw it onto the mat. There was a rumor that there was going to be a big time baby face turn on this show. I thought it might have been Nakamura, but it turns out that it was Zoe Stark. And let me tell you that it's probably not a good idea. Zoe Stark is a half baked chicken. You know, she's she's not fully baked. Turning her baby face doesn't really do her any good. Because she was barely over as a heel. Barely over. You know? Um, this seems to be a way to write Trish off. Like, she, Trish is not going to be around anymore. But I kind of assumed that she would be. I don't know why I assumed that. I assumed that Trish was going to finish this match. And then she was going to continue doing stuff. But if she's separated from Zoe Stark already, I guess the... The story is that she and Zoe are not doing anything anymore or that she's going to feud with Zoe Stark next, which I'm not a big fan of either one of those ideas. I don't know. But Zoe Stark is off to her next venture, which is to be basically Candice LeRae. She, yeah, she's a baby face, but she's not going to really be on TV. So I don't. I guess I guess they're trying to set up Zoe Stark as an opponent for Rhea Ripley, but I don't know. I don't know. I think she probably would have worked out better as being a heel for a little while longer. You know, she's, she hasn't been on the main roster that long, you know, and the crowd doesn't really know her. Like you have to ask the question when it comes to a baby face, when it comes to people that you're supposed to like, why do you like them? If you only like Zoe Stark because she beat up Trish Stratus because you don't like Trish Stratus or because Trish Stratus was bullying her. How does, how was that? consistent over time like six weeks from now how is that going to make zoe stark more over you know we don't know her the thing is the heel turn should have been okay now we need to get to know her um the crowd apparently uh turned trish babyface when she left when uh, zoe left um, I guess we were in commercial at the time where she, apparently Trish got a standing ovation or something like that, which is well-deserved, very well done stuff. The cage match to me, best women's match of the year. Um, I know that uh, there's probably some match I'm not thinking of, but right now knee jerk reaction. I will say that this cage match is probably the best women's match of the year. All right. So Becky Lynch, uh, we already knew what her next step was. She was backstage when she got confronted by Tiffany Stratton, who was also ringside during the match. Tiffany Stratton once again apologized for saying that Becky Lynch 
was a former NXT Women's Champion because it was not true. And <laughs> Becky Lynch decided to to say that uh, Tiffany Stratton crawled from her Mattel box to join them this evening, but she should be focusing on her NXT title match. And much like Tiffany Stratton would be, she was completely oblivious to the fact that she was being uh, insulted, and she just doodles and walked off. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a stupid reason to fight. She called me a champion that I never became. So now I'm going to be very upset with her. I mean, it just feels like Tiffany should have got involved. Like, you know, she should have slammed the cage door on, even if she failed in doing so. It would give her more of a reason to want to fight Becky Lynch or Becky Lynch to want to fight her. You know, I don't know. Just Tiffany Stratton being snooty and, and too much. It's like, well, if that's the case, she should fight all the women. Like, everybody. Especially Charlotte. Um, I don't think we could take any more Becky and Charlotte matches. All right, let's talk about John Cena. Da, 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 da. John Cena, he was on here. He didn't know how to be a host. He's not sure what hosting means. So he made himself the special guest referee for The Miz versus LA Knights. This brought The Miz out. The Miz doesn't want John Cena pandering to the crowd and said that he sucks as a host. So John Cena humbled himself and said, you know, you have a lot of experience hosting. Give me some advice. So the Miz says that he doesn't want a special guest referee. But if he wants some advice, he needs to get more involved. He needs to dress appropriately. First, he needs a referee shirt. Also, he needs to stop dressing like when he says uh, he says he dressed like a Teletubby and he's almost 50 years old. And then he says he, uh, John Cena needs to take charge. So then they start going back and forth because John says, OK, I'll do all of that. By making myself the referee for your match. And they did the no, yeah, no, yeah. Where Cena was uh, putting over LA Knight. Uh, LA Knight comes out eventually. Massive reaction. And we get this match. Uh, the Miz versus LA Knight. Special guest referee John Cena. John Cena disappeared quite a few times in this match. Which shows that he's actually a fairly decent referee. You know, he wasn't in the way too much. Uh, he did, they did give him some spots where he had to put his hands on the talent. He didn't punch him or anything like that, but he was moving them around. Like, when they were stomping guys in the corner, Cena had to grab them and pull them to the side. Um, and both guys argued with Cena, but LA Knight seems to be touchier about arguing with Cena. The crowd was absolutely greasy for LA Knight, by the way. It was just, just crazy. All right. All right, uh, Cena, of course, stopped Miz's cheating. He was he didn't also didn't do any kind of count outs. He <laughs> wasn't paying attention to anything like that. Um, there was one spot where Cena was actually shit as a referee. This was the skull crushing finale where uh, L.A. Knight didn't kick out. But you could tell that Cena was slowing up his cadence so that he could so that L.A. Knight could kick out. Which So he telegraphed the kick out. But I think people were not that upset by it. I don't think anybody was upset by it, but he did telegraph that kick out. All right, the uh, the big finish, uh, LA Knight hits the BFT, gets the pin, LA Knight wins. After the match, LA Knight jaw jacks with John Cena a little bit. John Cena says that he respects LA Knight, offered him a handshake. LA Knight says, well, you almost lost me that match. And then Cena's his hand just stayed there and eventually he shook it. Then Cena raised his hand to give him the rub. So Cena gave LA Knight the rub, which was very interesting and probably necessary. While the Miz took an L, which everybody knew was going to happen. This was a match I felt was too long. I felt like there was too much match here. You know, look, it was a solid match. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't boring. But I just felt like the match, you probably could have achieved the exact same thing in about half the time. You know, I felt like they went a little long here. But The Miz is very good playing off of John Cena, uh, getting some heat for the match before the match started. But it felt very much like a match they could have had on Raw. It's just 
Because, and especially since it spins out of, you know, the, the promo segment. Whenever the promo segment exists, and then a match, you know, comes out of the promo segment, it just feels like Monday Night Raw. And that's probably why I felt like this match was too long. It just feels like Monday Night Raw. But it wasn't terrible. It wasn't bad. All right, United States Championship. Rey Mysterio defeats Austin Theory. This match was really good. Fun match between these two. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of fun digs between Ray and Dominic recently. Uh, Ray is wearing a jacket that he wore when he was teaming with Dominic, but he got Dominic's face x out on it. Dominic recently, I think, went on the bump or something, talking about how Ray won the U.S. title, trying to overshadow him. But he's the champion of all of North America, which includes the United States. So he's the better champion anyway. Which uh, I think is excellent. That's excellent heel stuff from Dominic Mysterio. So we got a sliding DDT from under the ropes. I mean, Ray just looked amazing here. This guy, he can do all the stuff that he used to be able to do. He's not doing it as fast. But he can do all the stuff, especially all the head scissors and and uh, Austin Theory took very good bumps. You know, he was on point. He didn't botch anything. I think we need to probably need to work on his offense in terms of making his offense look good. Like, I don't like Austin Theory's finisher. It's kind of whack. But um, I think most of the match is very good. We got a rolling drop kick by Austin Theory into the chest of Ray. Ray bounced off the ropes, gave him a basement drop kick, and they both laid down. Uh, not as egregious as some other versions of that, of a similar type. Uh, the finish, however, was absolutely excellent. Austin Theory hits the 619. Uh, Ray is about to drop the splash with the springboard. Uh, Austin Theory gets his knees up. Then he pulls Ray on top of him, rolls upward. So now Ray is in a fallaway slam position. He puts Ray on his shoulders like he's going to do his finisher the eight town down but instead ray counters it with like a victory roll and ends up getting the pin fantastic finish great finish uh austin theory doesn't lose anything by losing to ray mysterio uh perfectly fine good shit you know i saw some people complaining about austin theory they don't like him i think people take their personal stuff out on these guys um, they just personally don't like Austin Theory. I don't say you could watch him. I mean, maybe you, you could say he could do more in terms of personality that they're not tapping into. And I agree with that. You know, but if you're going to be, his, you know, he needs to do more moves. I mean, like, well, he just needs to, ha- he needs to have a better finisher. That's for sure. But um, I don't know. I like Austin Theory. It seems that they're going to, do go in a different direction with him and the U S title is going in another area staying with the LWO or sorry, the PWO, but the P does not stand for Punani. It stands for Pittsburgh. It's Pittsburgh world order. They're selling uh local shirts again, WWE. They'll never pass up a chance to make a dime. I tell you that much. All right. So that match was really good. Uh, the tag title street fight. Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens actually lose to Damian Priest and Finn Balor. This match was chaotic. Very fun. I, 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 about three or four minutes into this match, I was like, I never want to see a street fight again. Uh, cause I saw a kendo stick and I was like, I, oh, I hate kendo sticks. I'm starting to hate chairs. I don't, I, I don't want to see this. But they did a really good job of getting me into it. Some fuckery, however, where Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens disappear after Dominic Mysterio show up um, to help uh, Finn and Damien. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn disappeared for like two minutes. Like nobody could find them. And they came back and they had wearing hockey jerseys. And then they started the, the hockey version of the fight where they had sticks and everything. This somehow Kevin Owens got busted open, which led to Sami Zayn being in the ring by himself with Damian Priest and Finn Balor. And he had to fight from underneath. So they worked that in. Uh, I still don't like that the referees and all of these people have to get involved to stop the bleeding. 
to me, is just the antithesis of this business. You know, I understand, you know, policy. I understand all this kind of stuff. But to me, it's the antithesis of the bill of the business. You know, you're going to it's it's so off putting, it, you know, even if, it, if it's accidental, let's just roll with it. You know, let's just roll with it. But anyway, uh, Kevin Owens showed a lot of fire in this match. I actually I can't believe I'm going to say this. But Kevin Owens actually impressed me in this match. With the amount of fire he was showing, with the intensity that he was showing, I genuinely felt like he was in a fight. I felt genuinely felt like he was in a fight for his life against these guys, or he hated these guys. He did a really good job here making me believe it. Um... He did the swanton off the balcony, which was absolutely batshit insane. <sighs> Destroyed Dominic. Of course, it wouldn't be the end of him, which, you know, it probably should have been. But my goodness, what a what a swanton off a balcony through a table. Absolutely phenomenal spot by Kevin Owens. Uh, various members of Judgment Day started running down to the ring. It got very crowded very quickly. Uh, J.D. McDonough was very cool, you know, after uh, Damian Priest got hit with a halluva kick, you know, J.D. McDonough was the first, was the second member of Judgment Day to to get involved, uh, even though he's not fully a member of Judgment Day, you might as well start counting him as a member, because they wouldn't have won this match without him, that much is for damn sure. Kevin Owens then destroyed J.D. McDonough by like powerbombing him on the table, or spine bustering him on the table violently so uh at one point Rhea Ripley came in she spin speared I'm sorry Kevin Owens through the barricade absolutely hurt him then Sami Zayn and Finn Balor were left one-on-one -on -one. this leads to Sami Zayn hitting the halluva kick and while he had Finn Balor pinned Dominic Mysterio dives in the ring with the money in the bank briefcase skimmed it right off of Sami Zayn's brain and then Finn Balor rolled over. One, two, three. Judgment Day win the tag team championships. I was definitely surprised by that. I was super surprised by that. Especially since on Friday they just teased Sammy and Kevin versus the Street Profits. They literally just <laughs> teased that. So the Judgment Day are the new bloodline where they run the company. They got the women's world title. They got the, the tag team championships and the money in the bank. And uh, it makes sense because as people pointed out to me and I wasn't paying much attention to it, Survivor Series is coming up. And they're going to want to uh, have at least one faction involved with Survivor Series. No point in breaking up Judgment Day just yet, considering there's a Survivor Series, who knows, uh, it might even be a War Games match or something like that we need to get into. So that explains it. Uh, it seems that Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are not out of the tag team picture just yet. They may have to work their way back in. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a rematch at some point, and they'll win the titles back. But this was a refreshing change of pace, mainly because... Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn have been the champions since April. And um, they've done nothing but fight Judgment Day anyway. And seemingly for no reason. And seemingly endlessly. And for and they've been winning the whole time. So finally this puts them behind the eight ball. And now they have to fight back. And they have to be the heroes to save Monday Night Raw from Judgment Day. And... That might help them get back over, considering they were over fighting the bloodline. They're not, I mean, Judgment Day clearly is not the bloodline, but having to fight that numeric advantage should give them some motivation and some sympathy. So that ought to work out a little bit. Next, Cody Rose comes out there to banter with Grayson Waller. So, uh, Grayson Waller, of course, arrogant heel. You're just out here to get the rub, mate. Cody Rhodes said that he had 
a announcement to make. But first, he denigrated uh, Grayson Waller, saying, "You know how these shows go. You know the the flower shop and all of them. We end up fighting." But then uh, Grace Waller is like, no, I don't want to fight in front of these great trees. I'm not going to do that. So Cody then said that he wanted the rub. He asked for the rub and he got it because he wants to give Grace Waller a scoop. And the scoop is that whatever political clout he has, he's decided to use it to right one of the great wrongs that he saw on SmackDown in recent weeks. And that is to bring Jay Uso to Monday Night Raw. The crowd went nuts as Jay Uso has a remixed theme of the Uso theme. So it's essentially the same song, but it sounds a little bit different. Um, Just a little bit, not a lot. The crowd went ape for Jay. Uh, Cody looked a little concerned. He, Him and Jay had a moment where they kind of looked at each other like, mm, we're, on the, we're on the same brand now, I guess. Uh... <laughs> So Cody leaves as Jay Uso comes into the ring. Grayson Waller keeps running his mouth. He got super kicked. Now, the idea here is that Jay has been removed from the bloodline story. And because it, it can't continue on Raw. You know, no other player from the bloodline story is on Raw for him to, to interact with. The only option, I guess, is would be to have Paul Heyman come over to Raw to interact with Jay Uso. But uh, Jay quitting because he doesn't want anything to do with his family anymore and then physically separating from them is good storytelling. You know, he he wants to be his own man, you know, as uh, Grayson Waller intimated that you know Jay Uso hasn't done anything, you know, in terms of being a solo act. He ain't done nothing. So he's going to come out here and establish himself. As a solo act. And you know what that means. If you don't know. Pay attention because I might tell you. I think he's going to win the Intercontinental Championship. That's what I think. I think that Jay Uso is going to be the guy. Who's going to dethrone Gunter. And win the Intercontinental title. Because Gunter is about to break the Intercontinental Championship record. He's going to break it. And then they're going to be looking for somebody. For him to drop the belt to. Nobody else on that roster is super over. Except Jay Uso and Cody. And Cody's not going to win the Intercontinental title. So, Jay Uso is going to win it. And he's going to be the guy who's going to beat Gunter. And that could lead to a Jeff Matt Hardy situation. Like when Jeff finally won the WWE title. And then Matt came in and started sabotaging him. I think that you'll probably get a similar situation here. Where... You know, Jay finally achieves something on his own and Jimmy and Solo and all these guys are going to probably sneak over to Raw or whatever and start screwing around with his career. Um, Because a lot of people realize that this is leading to no doubt a Jimmy versus Jay match at WrestleMania. What's the best way to utilize Jay Uso? But not rush the match. Well, the best way to do that is to get Jay off that program. And you can get Jay off the program by moving him to Raw. So now you got a super over baby face on Monday Night Raw. You know, that can definitely add something to that brand. And you got a really hot heel in Gunter who needs an opponent who can elevate him. And somebody who he can drop that title to. You know. And I think Jay Uso finally achieving some success on his own. Only for Heyman and Jimmy and all these guys to pop up on Raw. And get in his face and get in his way. Is really good storytelling. You know. It really keeps the bloodline story going. Because now as we know. You can't leave. You just can't leave the bloodline. You can, you know, you can go off and do your own thing, but you can't leave. It's blood. You're bounded by blood. You can't leave. So I'm guessing that's what's going to happen here is that Jay is about to find out that he cannot leave the bloodline. He can't quit. You can quit SmackDown. You can quit WWE. You can't quit being a twin. You can't quit being a brother. You can't quit being a cousin. 
So I wouldn't be surprised if they cost him the Intercontinental Championship, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he won it and then they, they were the reason he lost it. Um, especially Paul Heyman. Because, again, part of Jay's problem has been Paul, right? And Paul can go between the two brands. So we're in a situation where Jimmy could be doing something on SmackDown completely different with Solo, while Jay could be wrestling different people on Raw, but he's, they're both still interacting with Paul Heyman. So you're going to have Bloodline on both shows just doing different things. And this could be extremely interesting, depending on how they play it. Now, when it comes to Cody, the question is, why would Cody do this? What's in it for him? And I'm guessing we'll figure that part out later when it turns out to be a trade, a talent trade, where Cody will be traded to SmackDown, but they'll actually execute the trade later. Well, they'll get Jey Uso now, but they're going to hold Cody for a while. And then Cody will jump ship to SmackDown and, and announce that he was traded for Jay Uso, and now he's on SmackDown. I think that's probably what they're going to end up doing. I think that's the most sensible explanation for it. And it prevents Cody from winning the Royal Rumble again, because the only way for Cody to fight Roman again, if he's not on SmackDown, is he's got to win the Royal Rumble again. And I think some people will, you know, become a little pissy if Cody won the Royal Rumble two years in a row. From the looks of things, you could have Gunter win the Royal Rumble and um, he could fight Seth Rollins for the title or whatever, or whoever the world champion is going to be. And um, that's probably, you know, a better scenario for you. Um, and then you could just have Cody execute his trade or execute whatever political authority he might have to get himself put on SmackDown so that he can challenge Roman Reigns. And I think that's for the best. I think that's a good option. But Jay Uso to Raw is intriguing. It's very intriguing. And I think that him winning the Intercontinental Championship is probably the best thing for that title because it needs to be elevated. And I think Gunther can drop it to Jay and Jay can really do some really interesting stuff with it. All right. Women's world title, Raquel Rodriguez versus Rhea Ripley. And I felt this match was too long. And I felt like this was easily the weakest match on the show. Easily. Uh, Raquel Rodriguez, there was some, mm, some slight botching here and there. You know, uh, it wasn't the smoothest match in the world. They were telling the story that Raquel is bigger and stronger than Rhea. So she was like uh, no selling Rhea's clotheslines and stuff like this. There was a lot of intensity between the two women, a lot of yelling, a lot of them, you know, grinding their nose together and everything. Just uh, doing what they do. <laughs> and the match was solid. You know, it was a it was, I guess you could say, meh, you know, I guess you could say it was meh. I felt like it was too long. I didn't believe in Ra Raquel Rodriguez at any point. I don't think they did a good job of really uh, telling me anything about Raquel outside of that she's bigger and stronger than Rhea. They didn't show us much of anything. She, I think they worked the knee, but that was about it. They didn't really have much in this match. Dominic Mysterio comes into the ring, gets body slammed. That's a distraction. You know, uh, a setup uh, attack and then Riptide, one, two, three, match over. We probably could have did this a lot sooner. Um, but they wanted to get give Raquel the rub, I guess. So there it is. Um, are they going to continue this feud? Probably. Should they? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. They didn't actually mention that they are old friends until, you know, Twitter continuously tweeted about their 2000 what was it 2019 feud in NXT nobody was really talking about them being former friends and now they're enemies which you would think that's what this storyline would be about is that Rhea and Raquel were one point friends but that was kept under wraps but it was shared on Twitter it literally doesn't make any sense but uh, this felt like the weakest match on the show to me 
And even then, it wasn't terrible. It was just weak. I didn't believe in the contender. The match was kind of sloppy. It was a little all over the place. A simple distraction finish made it feel like Monday Night Raw again, too. Dominic gets in the ring, doesn't touch uh, anybody, so it's not a disqualification. And, but it's a distraction. Either it's a distraction roll-up or a distraction finish, and it sucks. So the finish was weak, and I felt like the match was too long. Main event, Shinsuke Nakamura versus Seth Rollins. So they flew the great Muda from Japan to the United States to see this match in the front row, leading everybody to believe that Shinsuke Nakamura was going to win the title here. They did a, a video before Nakamura's entrance, that had cartoons and it told the story that, you know, Rollins ego and all this kind of stuff has destroyed his honor and his code and he's suffering and, and Nakamura is going to come along to relieve that burden to end his suffering. And you're thinking to yourself, Nakamura is about to win the title. You know, that's what, that's what the great mood is here for. And the great mood is just a stand in for Antonio Inoki, by the way, who is his real mentor. You know, um, but Inoki is dead now, so you can't use him. So I guess Great Muda is next, <laughs> the next best you could do. Um, but they had a hell of a match, these two guys. They told the story they wanted to tell with Nakamura attacking the back. Nakamura is vicious. It's unrelenting. But they showed that he gets a little anxious. You know, um, when he was doing the setup for the Kinshasa, he couldn't wait so he, you know, went over and started kicking Rollins in the head and, you know, kicking him and booting him and stuff like this. Because he was getting a little anxious because he had him win. He had him the match won. But, you know, things weren't going his way. And so he kind of had a little bit of a meltdown. Uh, Rollins went aerial, which is very weird for a guy with an injured back that he would, you know, do a spring, springboard senton. And then try to do a springboard moonsault, and then end up with a in a tope suicida, <laughs> you know, or uh, some of the various other things that uh, Seth Rollins did in this match to pop the crowd. But um, they did some Japanese moves here. They did. Um, Seth Rollins used the rainmaker. They didn't call it that. They called it a rib core lariat, but. That's essentially what the Rainmaker is. They didn't call it that, though, which, you know, would have been nice if they did. Um, they did the uh, the landslide off the second rope, which, you know, attacks the back and probably would have been a really good false finish there. The finish to this match was very weak, however. Uh, Seth Rollins countered a roll-up into the stomp. It was sort of like a sunset flip. Where um, Nakamura pulled the legs down, Rollins rolled through, got up on his feet and stomped Nakamura, and Nakamura just stayed down, and that was it. I was like, "That's terrible!" Look, uh, I've always been a fan of Shinsuke Nakamura. They have absolutely beat out of me any interest in seeing Nakamura as world champion. That's been beat out of me for several years. And I thought I had it in my mind that it was going to happen when he beat John Cena and Randy Orton within a month of each other and then won the Royal Rumble and then went on to WrestleMania to wrestle AJ Styles. I was like, oh my God, it's going to happen. I was going to be excited because I was always a fan of Nakamura in New Japan. It never happened. Then I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Um, the Intercontinental Champion forever, United States Champion forever. Then you have times where he's a jobber, and you're just kind of like it, it gets beat out of you. The belief that Nakamura is ever going to be a star in WWE, or he's ever going to break through the glass ceiling and become what everybody believes wants him to be is people who are fans. And that's the first official Japanese world heavyweight champion in WWE. Uh, Antonio Inoki was the champion, but that's unrecognized. Let's put it like that. Okay. So when you fly the great Muda to the show, I'm thinking they're teasing Nakamura is going to win. That's, that's what he's there for. 
he's there to celebrate with his countrymen, you know, his, you know, a young boy who he watched grow up and to represent the Japanese wrestling fan, you know, as Nakamura finally gets that jewel for his crown. Instead, a single stomp ends it all. And everybody who felt re-energized in Nakamura. And let me tell you, there was a many. Pittsburgh was hot for Nakamura. It's been a long time since people have had this much energy behind Shinsuke Nakamura. I mean, there were people chanting for him all night. You know, um, there were, you know, during the match, there was a dueling chant where some people are singing Seth Rollins' theme song. Some are singing Nakamura's theme song. There's people, there's Nakamura, let's go Rollins. It's been forever since Nakamura got that kind of reaction. They completely re-energized them. They put the battery in everybody's back and think that this is, thing is about to happen. But it was entirely too soon, you know, because he literally was losing to Bronson Reed like three, like three weeks ago. He couldn't beat Bronson Reed. So... It's the miracle of superior booking that you take this guy who was barely on the show, could barely beat mid-carters who were barely on the show, but you book him at a level with the world champion, and you do some really good vignettes. He did like three or four really good vignettes. The guy is believable in the role, and people seemingly are ready for it, and then you don't do it. Very odd booking decision, but I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Again, they built an entire division around Seth Rollins. That was the whole point of the World Heavyweight Championship is to for Seth Rollins to finally have a, a championship so he can defend it. And twice now, they have re-energized an NXT guy in the hopes that that NXT guy will finally break through. We have believed and been pump faked into thinking that it's finally going to happen. They, they built several weeks of television around Finn Balor, him telling the story of the seven years and all this kind of stuff. Really good shit. Only for him to fail in the end. And everybody's scratching their head. Like, why would you tell that story and get everybody all jazzed up for it? Only for him to fail, you know. Um, of course, he's a heel, so of course he should fail, right? I mean, that's the that's the point. Now they've done the same thing with Nakamura. You spent, you know, about a month building up Nakamura to be absolutely lethal, and he loses to one stomp. It's mm. now Nakamura did attack uh, Seth Rollins after the match, which. Leads one to believe that there's going to be a rematch. Of, apparently Fast Lane is coming up. I don't know. Fast Lane to what, by the way? You do realize at the point it was called Fast Lane because it was the Fast Lane on the road to WrestleMania. This is the on the Fast Lane to the road to what exactly? Uh, I guess they'll tell me when they're ready for me to know. But Nakamura uh, losing was kind of expected. Uh, I didn't really think that Nakamura was going to win. I was hoping that he would win, <laughs> but, uh, but the booking has been so inconsistent that there really is no reason to believe it. I think that people have soured a little bit on Seth Rollins and they're now starting to become more interested in the villains that, uh, antagonize Seth Rollins. But it's just a, a cycle that when you're a baby face, people become more interested in the heels. And they've done a good job with that. They did it with Finn Balor. They did it with Nakamura. They'll probably do it with somebody else. But they're not ready for Rollins to lose the belt yet. And to be quite honest, he hasn't been champion that long. Nakamura is only the second real opponent that he's had. I'm talking about as a pay-per-view level opponent. And some people would even say he shouldn't have even been a pay-per-view level opponent. And he feels like he should have been wrestling him on Raw. Uh, in any event, they weren't going to switch the title so soon, but there was always the hope that Damian Priest could get it or that Nakamura could get it and we could be free of Seth Rollins wearing women's clothes or at the very least, 
that he would be freshened up because he wouldn't be the champion anymore. And now he can go back to being in a chase position. But after, you know, careful consideration, they put so much effort into making sure Rollins finally had something for himself that I don't think that they're ready for it yet. Rollins might be champion until WrestleMania, bro. I'm not even going to hold you up. He might be champion for a long time. You know, I don't know when the next Saudi show is, but he might be champion for a long time, bro. Uh, if my booking decision, you know, my fantasy booking decision were to happen, you could easily have Gunter lose the title to you know, lose his Intercontinental Championship to Jay Uso, perhaps at Fastlane, maybe, or maybe whatever event it comes after that. And then, you, of course, you do a short number of re, uh, rematches, and that should take you to January where Gunter can win the Royal Rumble and challenge for the World Heavyweight title. At that point, Seth Rollins will be doing battle with, you know, whatever re-energized NXT talent, probably uh, Johnny Gargano or Tommaso Ciampa or something like that by that point in time. And I wouldn't be surprised. It, it might be Bronson Reed, maybe. <laughs> I just I just know it's going to be some kind of uh, recent NXT talent, right? So, overall, I gave this show a pretty good grade. The show over-delivered. But I think part of it was the lack of interest that anybody even had in the show from the beginning. So it made the show easy to over deliver because nobody cared about it in the first place, <laughs> you know, but uh, the only match I really didn't care for was Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Rodriguez. I thought that all the other matches at least delivered some Trish Stratus and Becky Lynch over delivered Nakamura and Rollins hit the exact dude the right notes. Those two guys always work very well together. Miz and LA Knight was good, but maybe a little too long. The street fight was incredibly fun, chaotic, and I enjoyed it. I can't believe I enjoyed something that Kevin Owens was a part of. So, overall, really good show. And uh, the crowd was hot, and they had a reason to be. So, let me know what you guys think. Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace. Tell me what's worse than learning all that you led to believe was all horse crap.